it's on now? On? Oh, hi. Oh, thanks for coming. We're oh, looking forward to the talk. Thank you. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. We define two or three as, as two or five. <laughs> but I don't know how it's defined yeah, here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, welcome to today's uh, Center for Responsible Machine Learning Distinguished Lecture. So this is the second lecture um, in the series for the CRML Distinguished Lecture. And today we're extremely honored to uh, welcome Professor Dan Ross to UCSB. And uh, Professor Dan Ross has a very distinguished career in uh, AI, machine learning, natural language processing. And he's currently the Eduardo Glent, a distinguished professor in the um, Computer and Information Science Department at UPenn. Um, he is a fellow of many um, prestigious uh, societies such as ACL, um, AAAI, and uh, many others. And Professor Dan Ross is famous in many different uh, research. Uh, one thing I think you know that I know is um, ILP, right, integer. Uh, linear programming, um, understanding inference, understanding um, you know language, uh, and Professor Dan Ross is also the winner of the uh, Each Kai John McCarthy Award, which is the highest honor bestowed to uh, mid-career AI researcher. And today he's going to tell us about his uh, work on 
uh, reasoning. And the title of the talk is, It's Time to Reason. And with all that, let's welcome Professor Dan Ross. OK, thanks a lot, William. Thanks a lot for coming. Uh, can you hear me in the back? OK, so if you don't wave, so because I'm not using a mic here, I, I assume that it's loud enough. OK, so I, I do want to talk about uh, reasoning. And uh, this, this title indicates that uh, I want to talk about it mostly in the context of, of time, which is at least one interesting domain where we need uh, to think about reasoning. And uh, we've done a lot of work in. So I'm going to start by just telling you in general the stuff that we are doing uh, in my group at Penn. Um, so, so we're trying to do. Uh, a lot of things, all of the activities, interrelated activities that I believe uh, are going to lead us uh, in the direction of uh, natural language understanding. And that means thinking uh, a lot about learning and reasoning, in particular also about common sense reasoning, thinking about what I call learning with incidental supervision, sort of extending the protocol of uh, supervision from what we used to in standard supervised learning to other paradigms, thinking a lot about representations, continuous representation, symbolic representation, a lot about multilingual representations, uh, and a few other things. And all this is done in the context of some applications uh, in natural language uh, processing, natural language understanding, specifically thinking about events, time, quantities, space, uh, thinking about semantic uh, and in semantic typing, thinking about um, linking English as a second language and a few others. And, and in the larger box on the right there uh, is a new application area that we spend a lot of time on that I'm calling navigating information pollution, related a little bit to what other people think about as uh, in a narrower context as fake news or misinformation. Uh, and, and today I'm not going to talk about all these. I'm going to talk um, mostly about learning and reasoning, a little bit about incidental supervision, and I'm going to do this all in the context of thinking about events uh, and, and mostly about time. So, so in this time when everyone talks about AI and a lot of people think that we solve the problem, whatever the problem is, I want to, I want to start with some historical perspective. So this is uh, Terry Winograd and his PhD thesis uh, at MIT in 68, 1968, long before most of you were born. And basically, he solved the problem of communication with computer, building this system that is called Shrudlo. This was a system that allows a person to interact uh, with a blocked word domain uh, and basically uh, uh, talk about blocks, moving blocks, placing blocks, building stuff with blocks, and so on. Uh, and of course, he knew that it ha he hasn't solved the problem. Many people thought, just like today, we think that he, he did solve the problem. And the reason he he kind of made progress was mostly because his world was very, very small. And there were almost no ambiguity. All decisions were essentially one option and so on. Um, so moving forward uh, about 50 years, so, so he, he, by the way, understood that uh, in order to understand, execute, and interact, uh, you really need to understand language completely. Uh, and you need to be able to support reasoning. Otherwise, you don't understand what the goals are. You don't understand how to support decisions that advance the task you want to accomplish. So fast forward 50 years. This is our communication with computer uh, uh, project, a DARPA-supported project, where we're trying to do the same thing. Uh, we are basically playing Minecraft. I assume that a lot of you are familiar with Minecraft. So we have an architect that has a goal. Uh, and we have a builder that interacts with the architect and tries to understand the architect and the instruction they give so that they can accomplish the goal. And you can look at this uh, you know, simple dialogue over there, and you'll see how difficult it is to understand. And the bottom line is that we are very, very far from really interacting with computers uh, with, the, uh, with the goal of really achieving something, building something. So, so if we try to think about why this is, I think a simple example that illustrates where we are from Shrudlo all the way to our current CWC project, where we're trying to build, for example, this giraffe, given the instruction of the architect. So I think the difficulties can be uh, 
explain using this very simple example. So this was a data collection effort that we did about three years ago at the beginning of this project. Uh, and we simplified the task uh, to a large extent. So basically what you have is a table with a lot of blocks. All the blocks are named with names of companies. You can see Microsoft, you can see McDonald's, you can see Toyota. We did this in order to avoid the reference problem. So it's much easier to say the McDonald block than to say the block that is uh, to the left of this and to the right of that and before that. And the goal was the instructions were of the type, uh, I want to move a specific block to another place. For example, I need to move UPS from the left side of the board to just below Starbucks, leaving a small gap. So we collected data from users and how they express these kind of goals. And here is one example of what we got. Uh, imagine that this is a chessboard. Place the UPS in H2 and McDonald's in G6. Hopefully this surprises some of you uh, because you've never imagined that this will be the instruction. Nevertheless, most of you can do this immediately. And if you don't, you'll ask me, if you don't know chess, you will ask me, and it will take 30 seconds to explain to you what is a chessboard, how do we name places there, and you will be able to do it. But this is a challenge for our language understanding modules because it's a surprise thing. We'll never get 10,000 of these and train a model on this. We have to be able to think about it, reason about it, uh, and solve it. So uh, what does it take for us to be able to write programs that can do these kind of things? Uh, so really, that's what I want to talk about. Uh, now, it's clear that we've made progress in natural language processing. There's a lot of things that we can do today much, much better than even five years ago, not to mention 50 years ago. Most of these tasks are really information extraction tasks, mostly at the sentence level. Uh, but we cannot do this. So, so the rest of my talk is going to be trying to give you some optimistic thoughts about the challenges and the progress that we've made from the perspective of learning to reason uh, in the context of mostly reasoning about time. Uh, and really what I want to emphasize is how should we think about learning in the context of, of doing reasoning. So, so let me start with this puzzle that I'm going to ask you to read. What does it say? Nice to meet you too. Uh, excellent. So, so it took you about five, ten seconds. And, and most people get this very quickly. Some people will take a minute. But people get it. And, and if you think about it, it's really difficult. It's very challenging. I actually think about this as a good model for natural language understanding. So what have you done in order to get this so quickly? I assume you haven't seen this before. Uh, really, you had to identify units. You had to uh, consider multiple representation and interpretation because each unit here, once you segment it to units, has multiple interpretation as a standalone unit. But when I put it all together on one slide and you know that it has a meaning, uh, you figure it out. You disambiguate this contextually and you know which of the standalone interpretation makes sense in the context of the other interpretation and you know what it means. So, so I think that this is a very, very good model for what we do in natural language understanding, right? So a lot of times we have to assign values to multiple variables, uh, just like you've done here for all the units, and you have to account for the interdependencies among these. Uh, while this isn't natural language understanding per se, a lot of natural language understanding tasks really uh, can be abstracted this way. So, so the way I think about it is, Natural language understanding decisions are global decisions that require us, one, to make a lot of local predictions driven by different models, different times, uh, that were trained in different scenarios and under different conditions. It requires us to make uh, the ability to put together these predictions in a coherent way. And it requires the use of knowledge. You couldn't have done this puzzle without knowledge, knowledge that guides the decisions uh, so that they satisfy expectation. In this case, the expectation of this has to mean something because I put it all on one slide and I ask you what it means. So, so really, it's important to realize that the, the coherently and the satisfy the expectation are the key words here because 
these are knowledge intensive components. We have to be able to know how to use knowledge that we have, that we brought from home, not necessarily exist on the current slide or the previous slide and, and incorporate it. And, and of course, our programs, our natural language understanding program will have to know more in order to understand and communicate in natural language, but this already exemplifies two important aspects. So, so one is that understanding, whatever understanding means, uh, has a component, an important component of find the best interpretation, the best global interpretation of a bunch of phenomena that you see, and two, that it involves discrete reasoning. So uh, I want to give one other example in the context of communication. So many of you have Alexa, or you play with Siri, or you have Google Now, or something like this. And I think most of you are, are disappointed from the level of interaction or lack of that these systems can have. It's mostly a one-shot thing. So let's think a little bit about an interaction with such an assistant. So, Let's talk about dinner. The assistant could ask you, where do you want to go? And I'm going to say, say, I really enjoy Mexican food, but not when it's spicy. How about Mexican restaurant with plenty of non-spicy options? Uh, yep, is there one in Philadelphia? Uh, here are a couple of good options. And then the assistant is going to continue and give me some options. So what has happened here, if you think about it? Really what has happened is, this kind of program. So I'm going to read it to you, assuming that some of you don't understand these weird symbols there. Uh, we we want to have, uh, we want to make sure that there exists a restaurant. Uh, it has to be of uh, Mexican cuisine. It has to be in the city of Philadelphia. And it has to satisfy some constraints. Specifically, it has to have a menu. And the menu has to uh, have dishes and one of the dishes, that should be, there exists a dish that uh, is non-spicy. Now, this is a logical representation. And you don't have to implement it this way. In fact, I don't care how you implement it. As far as I'm concerned, and in fact, I'm sure that you will have to have some embeddings, neural embedding if you want, as a way to represent predicates and function and so on. But, but the lesson here is that any way you want to think about it, if you think about it in an abstract way, it shows that we actually need to incorporate declarative constraints. There's no way around it. This is what eventually the program is going to do. And it doesn't matter how you implement it. So, um, so today, a lot of people think, I hope not you, uh, think that symbols really are an evil invention of some old AI people. Uh, I don't think that's the case. I think that language is really a symbolic system. Uh, so, so this table here uh, is, uh, is really uh, a collection of things in the world. It's a symbol that represents a collection of things in the world. And even though we communicate via continuous signal, you know, speech, gesture, uh, writing, and so on, uh, we need symbols because these are the invariants of, of this communication. And you know, you don't need to take my word for it. A lot of smart people have written about it. These are some books that I highly recommend, from Sapiens all the way to Kripke uh, and the Enigma of Reason. They talk about the importance of symbols uh, as a way to kind of capture meaning and as a facilitator for allowing us to move up the hierarchy and be able to support reasoning. So once we introduce reasoning, hopefully you know who this guy is. Any guess? Aristotle. Aristotle, right? This is Aristotle. And, and many of you who have taken AI classes probably know who Aristotle is. He is basically really fa credited for funding, uh, founding formal logic, syllogism. And in AI classes, at least traditional AI classes, he is also famous for this example about uh, uh, all men are mortal and so on. Um, so, so uh, Aristotle, uh, did he have a laptop? <laughs> it's a funny question, right? It's a funny question because it's trivial to you. Uh, but you've never seen this question before. Nevertheless, you immediately come up with a strategy to reason about it. It's not written anywhere. In fact, it is written. If you search Google for it, you will find that the answer is yes because there's a book called Aristotle's Laptop. Uh, but we know that the answer is no. 
Uh, and the question is, how do we think about it, right? So, so today, most of NLP addresses well-defined tasks for which we have or can generate training data. But who asks the questions? So all of us has asked ourselves a question once I pose this question. Uh, and we, I'm not sure exactly what you ask, but something like approximately, when did he die? Approximately, when, did laptop, wh when were laptops invented? And which of these events came first? Uh, and, and even if you don't know exactly the answers, you know it approximately well enough to laugh about it. So, so um, we need to be able to do it, right? So the question, there's, there's no question that we need to be able to support this kind of reasoning because we do this all the time, every day, as we understand ourselves uh, and we understand natural language. The question is how to do it. How do we come up with these kind of strategies on the fly? Uh, and also how we train for it, because each one of these components has to be trainable. But the overall will never be, because you'll never see this question more than twice, definitely not 10,000 times, right? So you should be able to compose things over trainable models that are, are more primitive. Um, so the issue of how to supervise for these sparse events is really one of the key challenges that we have. I'm not going to talk a lot about it. This is a different talk that I call uh, learning with incidental supervision. I'm going to give a little bit of hints about it. Uh, but, but really the issue of how we learn. Do we learn everything together? Uh, do we have to decouple uh, various components of, of the task? How do we de decompose this task and so on? These are the key issues. Now, of course, these questions, I'm not the first one today to ask these questions. In fact, uh, one example of asking this question is actually came from my PhD thesis that was called Learning to Reason, uh, 95, a long time ago. But there we showed in a formal way, in a narrow context, um, the advantages of doing joint learning and reasoning. Uh, so now we're coming back to it because we have enough tools. Uh, and basically, that's what I want to do today. Before I get to it, I want to ask the questions, are we doing reasoning already in our NLP systems? And I'd like to argue that very little, if at all. And it's not only because we ask the questions, it's also because of the, the culture and how we run experiments and how we, uh, how we analyze what we do. And I'm going to give an example from a very impressive, very recent study of AI2, Ellen Institute of AI, the Aristo system. Uh, this is the title of the paper. Uh, this is uh, a culmination of a long-term project, six, seven years project, where they try to develop systems uh, to solve uh, science problems. Basically, the same standardized science problem that you know people in the US do in fourth grade, eighth grade, twelfth grade, and so on. Uh, uh, in fact, my group has done several steps on this, and this is a very, very difficult data set. Uh, and the results that they achieve are amazing. So you can see here that with Bert and Roberta and some ensemble of systems, they got results in the 80s. Very impressive. Now, so the question I want to pose is, are they doing reasoning? Because the, the, the idea was that in order to solve these science problems, you actually have to be able to do some reasoning. So let's see. So here's an example question. Uh, the rate at which wave passes through a medium is known as its speed. And I assume you know the answer. And the way it works is they're given a question, they have four options, and then they uh, look for context, supporting context for each one of the options. And, and, for, and the results, as I said, with Roberta and Bert, I show both of them here, are really amazing, around 80%. And if you look at the specific model behavior for this question, you also see that it's very confident that it's the green option, the speed. Now, let's play with it a little bit and understand what it does. So it uses context. What happens if I don't give it the context? Right? So I'm going to drop the context and see what it knows. So no context. And surprisingly, it's actually doing quite well, even without context. The results drop a little bit, but the baseline without context is pretty high, still over 60%. And you can also see on the right there that it's still very, very confident that it's the speed option. You see a sliver of other options popping up at the bottom. But I actually want to bring it back to context because I want to see 
how well it supports reasoning. So what we can see here is that it's very confident about the green option. So let's trivialize the second option. If it's very confident now about the green option, when I trivialize the other options, it should do even better. So let's trivialize it. So I'm going to do it by replacing the context by the question itself. Zero, no, zero information, right? So I didn't add any information. And what happens now is that the results drop significantly. And now it thinks that the red option, the trivial one, is the right option. I'm going to, in fact, ask uh, this 10 times. I'm going to add to the context 10 copies of the question. And what you see, that the performance drops even more. It gets to around 20%. And it's even more confident that it's the red option. Um, what does that mean? So, so there's no dispute that it gets 80% on the original data set, or 80-some percent. What is clear, though, that it's not doing reasoning. It basically knew a lot of stuff just because we train a good language model. And it's doing some word matching. And we've done some other experiments to try to analyze this a little bit better. But it's completely clear that we're doing something here. We're not doing the type of reasoning that we think we need to do. So, so really, we have to think about how to address these sparse challenges that we cannot train directly for, which is what happened in this Aristotle. They train directly for this and basically memorize, in some sense, uh, a lot of stuff. And specifically, we have to think about the composition and composition and a few other things. So I'm going to do this um, in three parts. I'm going to talk first about uh, a paradigm of assigning values to multiple interrelated variables. You can think about the puzzle that I produced before uh, as an example. And I'm going to also show example from, from the event domain. I'm going to talk about uh, another type of reasoning of computing functions that I view as computing functions over multiple interrelated inferred variables. Uh, my, exam my running example here is going to be reading a recap of a football game and trying to answer questions relative to it. Um, and I'm going to talk about decisions over a dynamic set of interrelated variables. And you can think about the Aristotle example uh, as, as an example for this, because when I see this example, I don't even know what are the variables, so that the composition of this is difficult. Uh, and I'm going to focus mostly in this context on the type of common sense that we need to have in order to address these questions. In fact, the order in which I'm going to present it is different. It's one, two, three, as we see here. And, and let's start. So, so I want to talk about events, because the context in which I'm going to reason here is going to be that of events. Um, so I'm going to talk about, for example, if you look at the paragraph on the left, it describes a bunch of events. And I want to understand the temporal order in which these events occur. I also want to understand the structure in which these events occur, because events you can think about very primitive events, and on top of them, more sophisticated or, or higher level events that I can call situations. Uh, so basically, I want to understand relations among individual uh, primitive events. I'm going to focus today on the graph on the left, which is temporal relations between them. And I also want to understand, uh, in the context of time of events, various aspects of common sense. What is the duration of typical things? What is the typical duration of a talk? What is the typical duration of an NBA game? What is the typical duration of an undergraduate degree? Uh, and, and so on. So uh, I'm going to go into all these applications. And I just want to say one thing, that the reason we care about this uh, is, of course, because we want to advance reasoning tasks in natural language understanding. But this specific domain is interesting because in nat natural language processing, we have to start moving away from thinking about sentences as the building block and think about events as the building block. Because why do we need language? I mean, we really think about, you and me, think about events and relations between them, not about sentences. Um, OK, so events. Here are two events. People were angry. Police used tear gas. Um, what is the order in which these two events happened? So this actually is very important, because if you think about people who are angry happened before police used tear gas, you have one interpretation of the events. They were angry at something. And therefore, the police, um, which ended in violent conflicts, and therefore, the police used tear gas. 
But if I think about it in a different order, the interpretation is completely different. Now the police use tear gas, and therefore people are angry at the police. So, so understanding the order in which events uh, happened is, is crucially important. And typically, uh, people are not going to give it to us. So it's very rare that uh, explicit time is mentioned in events, when you read the news, for example. Uh, and we basically have to use the context in order to understand what happens first. Uh, so really what we need is we need to infer this kind of graph, identify events and identify relations between them. And specifically here, I'm just limiting it to before, after, and included. Um, now, this is very hard because if you have n events in a paragraph, n primitive events, uh, you have order of n square edges that you have to predict. Thinking about it as an annotation task is very difficult. People actually don't do it. What people do is they annotate very partial graphs, uh, just like this, because it's hard to do. However, there's a lot of additional information that you and me have about this. Uh, for example, uh, we have strong assumptions, like we, we have strong pieces of knowledge like transitivity. We know that if A happened before B and B happened before C, then A happened before C. The way I'm giving it here is a slightly different example. I know that if ripping is part of cascaded and cascaded happened before ordered, therefore ripping happened before ordered. It's another instantiation of transitivity. So that's one piece of knowledge that I have and I want to be able to use to help me here. There's another piece of knowledge that I want to use. We know that some events tend to precede others or follow others. So if you sit on a given event, you have some idea of what might have happened earlier and what, might, what could happen later. To, to just illustrate this, look at this sentence here. More than 10 people have event one, police said, a car on Friday in a group of men. If I ask you which happened first, event one or event two, it's going to be difficult. On the other hand, if I add the lexical item here, now you know. So the lexical item itself carries a lot of knowledge with it. Uh, and we want to be able to reproduce it. So, so the two of the key questions here is how to exploit these expectations that we have. In this case, I'm giving you one declarative, like transitivity, and one statistical, which is what do I know about things that typically happen before and typically happen after? Uh, and of course, how does this impact, super, impact supervision? Yeah. Does it uh, matter whether you're doing forward or backward reasoning in terms of, I mean, we often are lazy. We don't, we'll not try to even understand a piece of paragraph until you ask me a question about it. Yes, and, and in fact, that will be another, typically another constraint because when you ask me a question, you fix some of the arguments and you ask me about others. And I think it's the same computational task. You basically give me some declarative constraints. Uh, so I think it, it's actually a good example of, of uh, an application of the framework that I'm going to introduce now. So, so here is one way to, to think about this computationally. This is in fact a framework that we've been thinking about for about 15 years and a lot of people in the NLP community have thought about and, and I'm going to present it on one slide and, and give you some way, way to think about it in the context of, of uh, relations between events. So, so basically what we want is we want to be able to uh, think about a linear objective function over a set of uh, functions phi of x, y, where x is my input, my observation, my sentence or my paragraph y is the vector of all the variables that I need to instantiate. For example, all the relations that exist between uh, events. So phi of x, y could be a set of features, could be a set of models, could be neural networks if you want. This is where nonlinearity comes into this objective. And then I have a set of weights uh, that allow me to weigh uh, these models. So think about it just as a linear model. It's a very expressive thing. Every logical function that you want can be modeled as these uh, linear functions. And in addition, I want to add to this objective knowledge. The knowledge comp uh, component is going to be modeled as constraints that could be soft constraints. And again, I'm going to have a set of weights which will be a penalty for 
how much I'm going to pay if I violate these constraints. And I'm going to model these constraints as a function c of x, y. Again, x is the input, y is the set of variables I want to assign values to. And, and this c of x, y really measures how far my proposed decision, y, is from an expected or illegal uh, assignment. So this is, this is an expressive uh, framework. And in fact, I can reformulate this objective function here as, as an integer linear program. It doesn't matter exactly how this is done. This is essentially very simple. Uh, and this goes all the way back to work that my student Scott Yee did about 15 years ago uh, and goes also to framework that Ben Tasker proposed a little bit later. Uh, one interesting thing is that the <coughs> models themselves, the variables themselves, can be models, which allows you to actually think about this also recursively. Now, the framework uh, is interesting for many reasons partly because it uh, forces you to think about a lot of the important questions here. What are the variables? How to represent the knowledge? And of course, the question is how expressive this is. Uh, we know today that all Boolean functions can be expressed as a set, as sets of linear constraints, so it's very expressive. Every map problem in a probabilistic model can be expressed as an ILP. Uh, so in this sense, it's expressive, and it also forces you to think explicitly about various training paradigms. Should I train the left side of the objective together with the right side, the knowledge piece? Should I train them together? Should I read the constraints or the knowledge from some other place, from Wikipedia or given by people? Uh, and a lot of other questions, and some of them we already have understanding for. But what I want to uh, get to today is mostly, is this still relevant in the neural network era where people think that deep network are going to solve everything? The answer is yes, and we have some evidence for it in our work uh, that I highlight here and, and in works of other people. And in fact, I'm going to give you very briefly a neural implementation of this CCM, of this condition, constraint conditional model. But before that, I'm going to jump directly to the results that we've accomplished, again, in the context of temporal reasoning. Uh, without giving a lot of details, what has happened over the last three, four years is semi-revolution in temporal reasoning. So in 2015, uh, the community was able to do something like 50% F1 in identifying temporal relations between events. Uh, now, 2019, uh, we can do close to 80%. Mostly it's the work of my students, uh, Chiang Ning, uh, and it composed of a lot of steps, and I'm not going to get into these steps, I just want to say that the key thing uh, is that it involves reasoning with external knowledge via a neural implementation of, of CCMs. Two types of external knowledge, both declarative, like transitivity, and statistical, which really means common sense knowledge or temporal common sense knowledge. There is one other, so, so basically this is uh, a, a realization of the objective that I showed before, the CCM objective that I showed before. I want to highlight one thing here, which is you can see that there is the yellow uh, gap there that uh, under the title access data set, which actually is another conceptual step that has nothing to do with neural network, where we actually realized that in order to think about events and relations between them, you have to think a little bit more carefully about types of events. Not all events can be comp comparable. So some events really happen. Some of it events are just intention. Sometimes you just hypothesize something or think about something. So you have to really think about multiple access and compare events mostly within an access rather than all events. In fact, this reduces the amount of data you will have because not all the n-square comparisons will be there, uh, but it improves the quality of the data because these are the really meaningful comparisons and will help you to improve it. But I'm not going to focus about this. I'm going to focus on what I've written there on the right, which is common sense knowledge. What is the type of common sense knowledge that we need here? Mostly, we want to be able to think about relations between events and what kind of knowledge do we have about this. So we basically ran a system, a, a ver a, an early version of the system on a lot of data, and took statistics over it. It's important to realize that the temporal order of events 
is different than the order of occurrences in the text. Here is an example. If you think about accept and propose, uh, accept appears before propose, but 77% of the times, the order is actually uh, reversed. And this happens with a lot of pairs. So the bottom line is that if you take this kind of statistic, you can get a lot of these histograms. So for each event, you can get a distribution of what might have happened before it and what happened after it. So let me focus on one event. Uh, in an academic environment, grant is a very important event. So you can see here that before grant, you seek, you request, you write. After grant, you use, you pay, you speak, you work. So makes sense, right? So must be true. So this is the type of distribution that you can use, th that you can acquire, and then you plug it in to the same framework that I described before, the CCS as a soft component, soft constraints component, and you can get uh, improved results. Um, of course, this is not the only type of common sense or not even temporal common sense that we need. I'm going to talk a little bit more about temporal common sense in a few minutes. Uh, but to remind you, this is kind of what we get. Um, okay, how do we get this? So uh, I'm not going to dwell on the neural implementation of CCM because I see that I'm a little bit behind, but I'm going to focus on one component here which I think is the most interesting one, and this is the top right, which is how we incorporate the common sense reasoning in this case, which we basically we're taking the knowledge base that we've learned, the statistical knowledge base, and we use, we train a CMEs network so that we'll be able to expand over the information that exists in the knowledge base uh, and be able to understand also relation between events that we've never seen before, just by uh, exploiting embeddings, for example, as a way to generalize it. Um, and on the bottom right, uh, what you see is basically the ILP component. So doing ILP inference on top of everything as a way to make sure that you can also satisfy the declarative constraints. OK, so, so let me move on um, to think about the final thing that I want to say in this part, which is something about supervision. Uh, so, so really the, the goal of all we are doing here is to induce semantics, right? So we're inducing semantics, uh, semantic representation, so that we can support decisions that depend on it. Now, it's clear that this requires learning, and in terms, it requires some type of supervision. Um, the standard machine learning methodology given a task, collect data for this task, annotate it, learn a model. Uh, but I'd like to argue that this will, nev will never have enough annotated data to train all the models for all the tasks we care about. In fact, we don't even know what are all the tasks. Um, so we really need to think about uh, other paradigms because the current methodology isn't scalable, often makes no sense. Uh, so so uh, I, I'm not saying that supervised learning is bad. We are going to do supervised learning too. But in most interesting cases, learning should be, in fact is, I think, uh, driven by incidental supervision signals. Uh, and I've written a lot about it. And what do I mean when I say incidental supervision? It means how to understand, how to acquire and use signals that were not put there um, to help a specific target task. So uh, there's a lot of ways you can think about it. Um, uh, and, and I'm not going to get into the details, but key examples could include the use of external resources, like encyclopedic resources, like um, Wikipedia, as a way to support zero-shot decisions. And you can think about it in the context of text classifications, where the standard way to think about it is just as a multi-class classification that we train for, but really there's no need to do it because if you understand the labels, you can just classify documents into it. So the question is how to understand the labels. And this is something that we can do with external resources. The same thing happens with multilingual NLP. Uh, there's no need in many cases to have data in all languages in order to perform in all languages because there's a lot of ways to map information from one to another. So 
Again, as I said, this is a separate talk that I'm not going to um, talk about, but there's a lot of uh, reasons to think about this. I'm going to talk about one very specific type of incidental supervision in the context of the problem I talked about before, and this is the context of identifying this graph that really is labeled only partially, like this. Um, and as I said, we have a lot of knowledge. We have expectation of transitivity and some statistical constraints. So, so the intuition that I want to sell is that um, if the structure is tight, that is, if we have a lot of expectations, like transitivity and like statistical expectations from the output, then there's no need to annotate everything. Very partial annotation is going to do the work. And I'm going to give some uh, idea of why this is so, or in fact, results that show that this is so. so. So the way we've looked at it is we define some information theoretic measures of the benefit that you get from an additional label. So think about this graph that I showed before. You label it partially, and then the question is, do I want to add another label? Is it going to benefit me in the training process? So we have a metric that we call here delta k for ik minus ik minus 1 that determines what is the value of the kth label. And what you can see in this graph is uh, as the arrow goes down, as the curve goes down, the structure is more tight. And what you can see is that the benefit of the labels goes to the right, goes down. And, and we did it here uh, on various types of structures, from very loose structures up to bipartite graphs and chains that are very tight structures. Uh, now, you can take this theory and, and basically algorithmically try it on multiple NLP problems uh, from just BIO chunking to semantic labeling all the way in the top right to temporal reasoning where really the structure is a chain. And you can see that there you gain a lot. Uh, the gap is pretty large between having all the labels or par partial labels. Partial labels actually are doing the work uh, in a much better way. Of course, you have to think about algorithms, how to exploit this information. I'm not going to get into it. But again, what, what you can uh, get is, indeed, as I said, if the structure is tight, you don't need to annotate all the variables. You can really uh, uh, use partial signals and you can exploit the knowledge that you have. A as a final thing I want to say about it is, is a way to um, kind of do a comparison here. So what you can think about is the following experiment. So you have some budget for data. Uh, and you can use this budget in one of two ways. On the left side, the blue one, you're going to completely annotate some graphs, but not all the graphs. On the right side, you're going to partially annotate all the graphs. And th the budget is fixed on both these sides. So the question is, which one is going to give you more training? And in the context of uh, uh, temporal relations where the structure is tight, you can see that the partial annotation gives you a lot of benefit. It's actually much better than full annotation of graphs if the number of graphs is smaller. So this is just a verification that this theory makes sense. And today we're trying to sort of push this theory a little bit further uh, and try to understand also uh, learning bounds and, and maybe uh, additional protocols that can gain from these insights. OK, so, so let me, uh, so I finished the first part. The, the next two parts are going to be shorter. And I'm going to start by talking about the second part, as I said, uh, and focus really on common sense uh, reasoning or temporal common sense. So, so every piece of text that you read, and you can look at this piece of text, you actually read in it a lot more than what's written there. So if you look at this piece of text, my friend Bill went to Duke, you already know a lot about your friend Bill. You know that uh, he went to college for about four years. He probably started around the age of 18. Uh, you know that uh, Bill was in North Carolina about for, for about four years. <coughs> you may know that Duke is in North Carolina, but there's a difference here because Duke is always in North Carolina, and he was there just for a specific amount of time. You also know that if he joined Google, he probably joined Google after graduation. You also know uh, 
that if he is a, a, a basketball fan uh, and he likes the NBA final, this is something that happens once a year and so on. So basically you read a lot of information in this piece of text that is just implicit in the document. All these are aspects of common sense, uh, uh, temporal common sense that we all have. And the question is how to drive acquiring this. So, so last year we proposed a data set that we called MC TACO. Uh, and essentially it's a QA data set that is supposed to drive um, thinking about temporal common sense. S so we have questions that have to do about typical time of events or frequency of events and also stationarity of events. The example could be something like Paul Simon is in New York City. Uh, let's go see him. You know that Paul Simon is probably for a few days in New York City. On the other hand, the Empire State Building is in New York City, but it's going to be there tomorrow too and next year too. So, um, so how do we deal with it? So we use this data set as a way to, one, acquire common sense or drive acquiring common sense knowledge, but also testing where are we today with the models that we have. And what you see here is that we are far. So <coughs> the best models that we have, BERT-based models, give us a gap of about 40% for where we expect to be with human performance. It's important here to comment that it's important how we evaluate these BERT-based models and other models like this, because they make a lot of uh, correct decisions accidentally. Just because, you know, they've read a lot of data and they make good guesses sometimes. So you have to be very careful in how you evaluate. So the way we do it here is we actually ask five versions of each question with respect to various aspects. And we count it as correct only if all the answers are correct. Because it's really the same question. If you know how to answer one version, you should know how to answer the second version. And if you answer two of them or three of them, it means that you just got lucky and you don't really know how to answer the questions. So if you don't do it this way and you just count, you get much, much better results. But this is just misleading. It, the model really doesn't know this is where the model is. Um, OK, so, so now with, with this challenge and the fact that BERT-based models are so bad, um, we have to think about where are we. Um, and perhaps more importantly, this challenge illustrates that uh, we really need to know how to decompose the questions. Each question like this has multiple components, and we have to be able to address each one of them. For example, this is a version of a question that appears in our data set. Will we make it to dinner before the movie? What does it mean to answer this question? You want to know, you want to know what's the time now. You want to know wh what time is the movie. You want to know uh, how, what is the typical time of dinner. And you want to know what is the typical time of driving to the movie. And you want to be able to put this together. So, so the current state of things is that uh, we first have to acquire common sense, uh, temporal common sense. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this. So I already talked about the, uh, the figure on the top left. And on the top right, you see an effort that we've done last year of acquiring distribution over quantities. In this case, typical time of events uh, and, and duration of events, uh, typical time of breakfast, lunch, brunch, and so on. Uh, and in fact, we acquired information about typical uh, distribution over other quantities. You know, what is the size of a lion, and, and you know, um, how large is how how much a, we a chair weighs. Uh, but I want to focus on the figures at the bottom, which is the more recent work that we've done, specifically on temporal uh, reasoning, uh, on temporal common sense. So, so what do we want to know here? So first of all, it's essential that we do we use context here. So if you think about um, uh, how long does move take, you really have to distinguish between various kinds of moves. So what you can see here uh, is how long does it take to move a chair versus how long does it take to move a piano? It takes more. How long does it take to move to a different city? It takes even longer. You can also see how we represent temporal distribution. We basically represent it over various time units, from seconds, minutes, hours, and so on, up to centuries. Uh, and this, is, this allows us to, to get distribution. So it's really important that we model the whole event not only the predicate, because the fine-grained 
information about the event is really essential here. So that's one aspect of it, contextual modeling. The second one is joint modeling over multiple events. Because it, people don't give you a lot of information in text. So, so no one will say how long it takes to brush one teeth. But people will say, uh, I brush my teeth uh, uh, while I showered. Or I brush my teeth, um, you know, this morning. Um, and, and you want to be able to, to get from these uh, hints a distribution over how long does it take to brush one teeth. But the example I give here is uh, distinguishing between, and, and you want to do it not only over different types of events, but also different aspects of events. So what you see here is duration and frequency over short break, holiday and, and vacation. So what you see is that short break takes you know, minutes to hours, holidays could take days or weeks, vacation could take even longer than that, and the frequency uh, of these events also correspond to this. So how do we do this? Just very briefly, uh, we can think about, um, first of all, we have to extract explicit uh, temporal mentions from a large corpus. Again, uh, some mentions are never there. No one is going to say, I opened the window in three minutes or in three seconds. But people will say, I opened the window five minutes ago. And you already have some constraint on how long it might take to open windows. Uh, so we want to be able to, to observe this. And we want to be able to represent events, which we represent as triples, event, the temporal dimensions, and the value, and build a sequential model, kind of BERT-like sequential model, over event representation so that we can mask complete events uh, and get distributions this way. So I'm not going to give a lot of results here. I just want to give you some impression. And what you see here is a comparison between BERT and our model. What you see here are, uh, after dimensionality reduction, uh, a plot, a visualization of plot that shows two types of events. Events that took minutes. These are the blue points. Hopefully you can see this. And events that take centuries, which are the orange points. And you can see that we have a pretty good separation between these two events while the BERT model doesn't have such good separations. OK, so where are we today? So we actually have surprisingly solid uh, acquisition of a lot of temporal uh, common sense. However, we don't know how to use it. So we still don't know whether Aristotle had a laptop. Uh, and we don't even know whether we can make it to dinner before the movie. So still the challenge is decompose or not decompose. And, and I want to finish with a couple of minutes of, of talking about this, talking about um, how to think about this decomposition, uh, the need to decompose, and, and how to model this. So I'm going to do this in the context of football games. So hopefully some of you understand football, and hopefully some of you don't understand. So this is a recap of a football game. Uh, and I want to ask some questions. This is a, a version of uh, a question from the AI2 drop data set. And the first question I can ask is, how many touchdowns did the Eagles score in the first quarter? So hopefully you can quickly read this. And I'm going to help you by highlighting this that supports that the answer is two. But if you really think about it, uh, how did they know that these were touchdowns scored by, by the Eagles? Yeah? OK, that's one option. If I know that the, this player plays on the Eagles, that would help me. But the text itself gives a hint. Right, so it says over there, uh, Redskins trailed early as. So, so if you understand this, one simple step of reasoning allows you to realize, yeah, it must be the Eagles uh, touchdowns. OK, so we can do this. Here's another question. OK, so, so what, what I want to highlight is that this question isn't available in any knowledge base. You have to understand the text and reason. And we do this all the time when we read text. Uh, this is really a problem that we call semantic parsing. I'm going to get to it in my next slide. Um, you really have to be able to learn a program or express a program over the text to understand this. But let me first ask another question. How many field goals did 
Washington score. So I'm going to highlight the part that you have to read here. Uh, and some people, when asked this question, tell me it's ill-defined. People that don't understand American football would agree that this is ill-defined. But if you know the scoring rules, you would know that the answer is three. Now, if you don't understand football, I can give you the rule, right? I'm going to give you half a page that defines the scoring rule. You'll read it and be able to answer the question. Now, there are several interesting things here. First of all, you have to be able to read the rules and use them in order to solve this question. Two, you have to realize that the text in the scoring rule book is very different than the text in the recap. The recap, everything is grounded. Everything is instantiated with names of people, with names of teams, and so on. In the rule book, everything is abstract. It's not that this field goal is three points and this touchdown is six points. Every touchdown is. So you have to be able to understand rules and instantiate them in the context of the text, which is another very difficult NLP problem. Okay, I can ask you other questions that I'm going to skip now. Uh, I just want to think about what are the computational tasks that we should think about, and I'm very quickly going to uh, talk about what we do. Uh, so, so we really need to induce a program, a program that has some executable components at the leaves. So, so the leaves have to be things like, this phrase indicates a field goal. This player scored it. This team uh, got the points or this is the length of the field goal, or this is the time the field goal was scored, and so on. And then we want to be able to reason symbolically over it. We want to be able to know the longest, the shortest, the fast, the last, and so on. So, so we should be able to induce these kind of programs. And, and what you see here is some representation of the output uh, that we generate, which is you know, some attention over uh, these executable mo the output of the executable models. You know, and, and then the program that we can develop here. But, but more important is we train this end-to-end. End-to-end is sometimes very important because it allows you to get feedback that makes sense, just the answer. You don't need to get uh, feedback at the level of this is the player, this is the field goal, and so on. Only sensible uh, feedback. On the other hand, um, does it make sense to learn what max means in the context of reading recaps? You probably knew what max is long before you started to read uh, recap of football games. So how do we do this in the context of these things? How do we learn things yesterday and then use them in the context of these kind of programs? Again, go back to the puzzle that I asked at the beginning. This is kind of what you did. And, and this drives a suggestion for another uh, perspective, another way to model exactly this problem. Uh, basically, QA via inference over semantic graphs. Semantic graphs that can be induced independently of the problem, not in an end-to-end -end way. You just induce semantic graphs. And what I show here is multiple layers of semantic graphs uh, that could be some symbolic and some continuous. And then, uh, we want to reason over it with a constraint optimization way, which is very similar to the type of reasoning that I described earlier in the context of temporal reasoning. Basically, a constraint optimization problem. Um, I think about constraint optimization as an optimization method that already recovered from the differentiability virus. Most of us haven't. Uh, but, but really, it's an interesting way, alternative to what I showed before, that isn't necessarily dependent on the QA paradigm. It can be used to address many other problems, like algebra word problems, like physics 101 problems, where, again, you have a piece of text and you have a lot of knowledge that you have to put together in order to solve it. <coughs> I think that it's a more robust method in some uh, respects because it's easier to bring in knowledge. Um, Okay, given the time, I'm going to skip my next example and, and summarize. Um, basically, what I wanted to show is uh, a small sample from a research program that tries to address what I think are some of the key scientific and engineering challenges between us and understanding NLP. So I gave you a lot of examples from some of the things that we're doing. 
really most of them had to do with events and temporal reasoning tasks and common sense reasoning that, that is an essential component of this. I talked a little bit about supervision. There's a lot more to say about supervision uh, because it's important to think about uh, how we supervise and in what way <coughs> reasoning helps us supervise. So all this work was done by some of my students and I'm showing them here. Uh, and thank you. We have time for questions. So I'll start off uh, with a question. So I think, um, uh, you know, after today's talk, um, I'm now convinced that we only solved maybe 1% of AI's uh, questions so far. Um, I think. So I achieved my goal. <laughs> <laughs> right, but I think, um, you know, if we think carefully about uh, temporal reasoning and some of the other things you said, it seems like it's very related to causal reasoning because you know some of the definitions about causal reasoning is because it happens in time and then you know event A affects event B and then therefore there's this um, you know causal relationship. Can you comment a little bit on the relationship between causal reasoning and um, for example the reasoning and temporal reasoning you mentioned? Yeah, I completely agree. Very related. And in fact, some of the papers, we, we actually put causal in the title, but I think this was uh, a little bit arrogant because I don't think we actually uh, did causal. So I, I think there's a difference between when people say in text, this causes that, and when things really cause something. And, and we really have uh, a long way to go before we have good models for this really causes something. Uh, so what we can do from text only uh, at the causal level is very, very uh, rudimentary. I think we have to probably improve our common sense uh, acquisition models before we can actually talk about causality in a better way and maybe incorporate some other modalities so that we can include this. So, so I feel that even though they are very, very related, most of the stuff that we're doing now really isn't causality, uh, at least not in, in Yuda Perl's uh, notion of causality, although we want to get there. So as a follow-up, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so follow uh, what is the relationship, what you said to the arrow of time, right? Because that's, your, that's the causal flow that you're looking at so based upon so I'm, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by error of time but I mean that takes time and it uh, puts a causal relationship in terms of the events over so, time. so that that aspect I think we we are addressing at some level so so we can understand uh, how to build timelines of events we understand at least partly how long events take, what is the order between events, what is typical <coughs> time of events and so on. So, so we can place events on a timeline. Um, but as I said, I think it's related to causality, but it's not necessarily uh, that we address uh, causality. So uh, I was going to ask for the constraints, um, I mean, some of the examples you gave were like, you know, easy for humans and tough for computers, but in terms of constraint reasoning, computers are actually could do things much faster than the humans. So, uh, and especially if the more, for more complex theories, you know, you can uh, do reasoning on linear arithmetic constraints that humans cannot do fast enough. So, so is there a way to add, you know, power of computing that is much better than human brain actually on constraint reasoning and go beyond that uh, what humans can do. Because why, why restrict you know, the constraint reasoning that humans can do but go beyond that? So, so, so definitely, I mean, computer can compute things faster. They can compute, they can do uh, you know, computation much faster than we can do. The difficulty that you see when you try to do natural language processing is that the problem 
in AI is not the computation, at least not in this sense. So, so you can take an algebra word problem, you know. Dan had six books, he wanted to share it with two of his friends. Or uh, he wanted to give it to two of his friends. These are two different problems, right? Give it to, share it with. Uh, a tiny difference. Now, the difficulty is not to solve the equation. The difficulty is to understand what is the equation that corresponds to this question. And even in this mapping from natural language to an equation, we need to use knowledge. Knowledge in this case of what is given, what is shared, or, and, and uh, the fact that six is divisible both by two and three is important here. So, so this is the type of knowledge we need in order to map it to the equation. Once you got to the equation, give it to your powerful solver. In this case, you don't need a powerful solver. But, but, but I think what we realized, and it took a long time, is that the computation itself is the easy part, and computers are very good at it. But the mapping to the stage where you can compute is the difficult part, and this is what we, where we're kind of struggling in, the, in NLP and, in fact, all high-level cognition tasks. Yeah, very, very interesting talk. So, so uh, um, a related question to what, what Tafik's asking. Um, so, so you've shown us several examples on, on the um, piece of article, uh, a paragraph where we can read in between the lines and get a lot more information and answer more complicated questions than, than the, 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 like simply understanding the piece of text by uh, using logical reasoning and applying constraints, applying knowledge that we, we, we've already uh, had. Um, so, so do, do, do you have like human like subject study that shows like when people are reading and given how much time that uh, th this person have to read a piece of text without um, first asking them questions? So how much how much are these computations are what what people are implicitly doing while they are reading a piece of text, and how much of these are um, like? Uh, triggered by uh, uh, in-depth questions about this particular uh, paragraph. So, so the question is, is really about, um, like in many tasks, um, like we've, we are claiming that machines are not better than human, like object recognition and all that. Like how far are we uh, from achieving that? Um, and, and what are the amount of resources we are given the human in order to set up a fair benchmark? Okay, so, so, so first, I, I, I think what you're asking is, is two questions. Um, whether machines are better than humans or not uh, should not be addressed in the context of a given data set. I think this is a mistake, and that's why you see in the media uh, question answering systems uh, are doing better than people, which is ridiculous because on a given data set, of course, you can train a model over 100,000 questions and it will achieve much better results than people because people tend to make mistakes. Uh, but change the question a little bit, as I showed in the Aristo example, and machines have no clue what the, they don't have an understanding of the, tax, the task, nor of the text, and every five years old uh, has it. So, so if we want to do comparison, we have to do it very, very carefully. Uh, and I think we're not doing the right uh, comparison today. Second, the first question that you ask, I think, is actually very interesting, which is, what do people know after they read a piece of text? And there's been a lot of work on this. Uh, in fact, going back to uh, 50 years ago, almost. And, and people, uh, so, so I am not completely fluent in this literature, but, but two things that I remember is, one, there is research that shows that as a function of what people think they will need to know, uh, they spend less or more time on various parts of the text. In fact, in the visual domain, there's beautiful questions that show that if you read um, um, a description that comes with, with uh, visual uh, things, the time it takes you uh, to kind of understand the map and the text associated with it is a function of the length, the distance between, you know, uh, different play things that happen in the vision. And, and similar things happen in, uh, in text where people have shown with eye tracking equipment, uh, when do people read and then go back uh, to focus on 
what is this preposition uh, attached to, and, and so on. And if you ask them first questions before they read the text, they read the text in a different way than if you don't ask them questions. For example, you, I'll, I'll give you a piece of text, the one that I showed you before. I can ask you now which university Bill went to, and you will know. If I ask you how many times the word the appeared in this uh, document, you will not know. But had I told you before that that's going to be the question, of course you will figure it out. So, so, so what you get from a piece of text uh, depends on some expectation that you have with respect to what I do need to remember. And of course our programs still are far from know how to accept these conditions even as input. But, but I, I think it's very interesting because it basically means that the representation we have, uh, at least the short-term representation, is really a function of the task. There's a long-term representation that you use all the time that probably is a function of, you know, aggregation of many, many things that you've done before. Um, thanks for the cool talk. So um, I noticed that you used a few different ways to measure uh, the ability to reason over time. So for example, in your data set, um, it was five different versions of the same question. Later on, you had uh, the word embeddings and you visualize them. Uh, do you think there's a, is there a metric or is there a uh, unified way to measure uh, the progress uh, on this task since it seems like uh, the space uh, of challenges and uh, adversarial attacks seems very large. Yeah, yeah, I, I, it's a good question because I, I think there is no unified way. I think what I like is typically to look at extrinsic evaluation, that is, there is a task that you want to solve and I want you to show me that what you've learned, for example, temporal common sense, has impact on the task. And, and we have these results, in fact, I didn't show it here. Uh, but also, in addition to this, you also have to have some analysis abilities to kind of look more carefully in what you've learned to convince yourself that what you've learned makes sense uh, because there's always biases that come from the data set and you want to make sure that you don't get the numbers you got because of some biases in the data set or um, some other kind of um, unrelated issues, kind of like in the Aristo data set that I showed. So, so I think we always have to develop multiple metrics. I don't think there is a magical metric that will tell us uh, where we are. All right, great. So we're running out of time. I have a token of appreciation for uh, Professor Dan Ross. And uh, let's thank Dan again for the wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.